It happened once that Vivekananda, who was then called Naran, was offered a significant gift by his spiritual master, Sri Ramakrishna. Sri Ramakrishna said to him, Naran, you know I have gone through the most austere spiritual disciplines. I constantly pray to Mother Kali and worship God. I have done everything necessary and now I am blessed with occult power. But you know that I don't care for any outer achievements. I pay no attention even to wearing clothes. I am in my own world most of the time. So I wish to tell Mother Kali that I would like to offer you all my occult power. You will be able to use it when you have to work for the world at large. Naran immediately replied, Master, please tell me whether this power will be of any help to me in my God realization. Sri Ramakrishna said, No, no, you know that occult power has nothing to do with God realization. But when you realize God, if you want to work for the world, if you want to manifest God on earth, then this power can be of great help to you. Naran's immediate response was, first things first. First I want to realize God. Then if you and God want to give me occult power to use for mankind, I will take it. But right now, I want only God. God comes first in my life. Ramakrishna was extremely pleased with his dearest disciple. He said to the other disciples, look at my Naran. Look at the example he has set for you. You have to pay all attention to God first only to God. That is the only way you can realize God. Occult power is of very secondary importance. Most genuine spiritual masters have advised their disciples not to care for the hidden powers of the Kundalini. If a disciple cares only for truth, only for light, then he will make real progress in his inner life. We practice Kundalini Yoga in order to get power of one kind or another. But, if we meditate on God and please God the Creator, He will give us His entire creation if He wants to. If we want the Creator first and foremost, and not His creation, then we will get the Creator. And once we have the Creator, His entire creation will also be at our disposal. If we cry for one tiny part of the creation, we may get it with comparative ease, but the infinite wealth of the Creator will be withheld from us, and we will have to be satisfied with the tiny portion which we asked for. Truly advanced spiritual seekers will always ask God for the right things. Vivekananda was so poor that he could not make both ends meet. When he asked Ramakrishna for wealth, Ramakrishna said to him, I can't ask Mother Kali for wealth, but you go and ask her. As soon as Vivekananda entered into the temple to pray, he could not bring himself to ask Mother Kali for money. He prayed, Give me aspiration. Give me the voice of conscience. When Vivekananda returned, Ramakrishna said, What were you doing? Why did you not ask for material wealth? Vivekananda then went to the temple a second time, but again, he could not pray for wealth. Finally, he told Ramakrishna, I can't ask for these kind of material things. Ramakrishna said, I knew, I knew you would never be able to ask Mother Kali for material wealth. But Mother Kali is so pleased with your aspiration that she will take care of your family from now on. After that, Vivekananda never suffered from financial difficulties. Previously he had suffered because his relatives all stood against him and would not help him. Then because of Mother Kali, he was able to support his family. Vivekananda was a divine soul. So he asked for the right thing, and he got the right thing, spiritual wealth. Mother Kali was so pleased that she fulfilled not only his spiritual needs, but also his family's basic material needs. Some disciples feel that they have infinitely larger hearts than the Master, because at times the Master can appear to be very rude. God wants the Master to give an experience to an individual because by giving that experience, God will be able to bring that person away from the physical and closer to him on the inner plane. Outwardly, the master may be totally indifferent to the disciple. He may be extremely rude and the disciple may misunderstand him. But the master knows God's will. God's way of operating need not be like our own. God may tell the master not to look at a person for some time because then he will examine himself to see what is wrong. In the case of Vivekananda, how Sri Ramakrishna neglected him for months. 
He did this because he had got the message from Mother Kali to watch Vivekananda and examine him. If Vivekananda knew this, he learned it from within. He did not act like an ordinary man who says, You don't care for me, so I also don't care for you. He made unconditional surrender to Ramakrishna's will. Whether or not Ramakrishna smiled at him and showed him affection, gave him sweetmeats or totally ignored him, Vivekananda went to him again and again. This was real surrender. Sri Ramakrishna brought down another soul as powerful as Vivekananda's, exactly of the same standard, but he never saw that person on earth. Such a great spiritual master brought down two liberated souls, Vivekananda and another, but the other one fell. Ignorance covered him and he never came to his master. Ignorance enveloped that particular liberated soul to such an extent that Ramakrishna could not find him. This experience occurred after Sri Ramakrishna had left his physical body. One night, Sharada Devi was seated by the Ganges. The scene was flooded with moonlight. All of a sudden, she saw Sri Ramakrishna entering into the Ganges. His whole body melted into the water. Then Vivekananda appeared. He was chanting, Jai Ramakrishna, Jai Ramakrishna, Victory to Ramakrishna, Victory to Ramakrishna. Sarada Devi saw that with his two hands, Vivekananda was scattering the water of the Ganges on the heads of countless people and they were all being liberated. It was an unimaginable gathering. Then Sharada Devi said to herself, How can I enter into the water with my legs and feet now that it has become Thakur? So for many days she did not enter into the Ganges. A few years after Sri Ramakrishna left the body, Naran became a wandering sannyasin. His wanderings took him across the length and breadth of India. In the days of his pilgrimage, when he used to walk along the streets of India, here, there and everywhere, smoking was his great avocation. One evening, as Vivekananda was walking along a village street in northern India, he came to a small cottage where an old man was smoking an Indian hookah. Vivekananda had a tremendous desire to smoke and he asked the old man if he would give him his pipe. The man said, Oh Swami, I am a scavenger, I am an untouchable, how can I give you my hookah? And how will you smoke from the hookah of an untouchable? I am so happy to see you. You are so handsome, so spirited, I am so fortunate to see you, but alas, I come from an untouchable family. Vivekananda felt sorry that the old man was an untouchable. He said to him, I am sorry. I am sorry. Alas, I won't be able to smoke. Vivekananda left him and continued walking. In a few minutes he felt miserable. He said to himself, What am I doing? What am I doing? What have I done? What have I done? Did not Thakur teach me that wherever there is a human being, there is also Lord Shiva? Each human being embodies God. This is what I have learned from my master, Sri Ramakrishna. I have given up everything. I am a sannyasin, so I am one with the rest of the world by virtue of my renunciation. Yet although I have renounced everything, still I have preserved this sense of discrimination. Here is a cobbler, here is a scavenger, here is a brahmin, here is a shudra, low caste, high caste. How can I have the heart to distinguish? Are they not all God's children? The sense of separativity, the sense of superiority and inferiority, how can I have that kind of feeling? Vivekananda then went running back to the old man and said, Please, please, give me your hookah. Each man is God himself. The old man fearfully and at the same time happily gave the hookah to Swami Vivekananda. Swami Vivekananda smoked to his heart's content and then said to the old man, I am divinely happy, supremely happy, for two reasons. My human desire is fulfilled. I am able to smoke. And my divine desire is fulfilled because I have been able to realize my inner vision of universal oneness. My Supreme Lord abides in all. This vision of mine I have been able to manifest today by smoking here from your hookah at your house. God is for all. He is not only for me, but he is for all. In each individual, him to see, him to please unconditionally is my only goal. I shall remain ever grateful to you, 
for it is through you that my Lord has taught me the supreme lesson that we are all one, we are all equal, we are all children of our absolute Lord Supreme. At that time, he used many different names. When he journeyed to Delhi in 1891, for example, he assumed the name of Swami Vividishananda. Before that, he had also travelled under the names Vishikeshananda and Satchitananda. Then, on the eve of his departure for America, he took the name Vivekananda. This is how it happened. Naran's dearest friend, admirer and devotee came from Kerala in South India. His name was Alasinga Perumal. He was extremely, extremely devoted to Naran. He was supposed to take care of Naran's passport. So he went to the passport office in Madras and wrote down the name that the Swami had been using, Vishikeshananda. It means the dancing waves of the ocean. The meaning is so significant, but the word itself is not at all sweet. What a horrible name, exclaimed Alasinga Paramal. Then he consulted with the other devotees in Madras and they were all of the same opinion. A few days later, he brought the passport to Naran. When Naran looked at it, he said, what is this? This is not my name. Then all the devotees replied, Yes, this is your name. We did not like that old name you gave yourself. Vivekananda has to be your name. It is far, far better. It has much more meaning around it. Naran could not argue with his disciples, so he took the name Vivekananda. It means the most powerful delight of all pervading conscience. If you develop your conscience, you cannot tell lies or do anything wrong or undivine. Your conscience will all the time poke you. Some people say that this name means discrimination, but the actual meaning is conscience. Where does discrimination come from? From conscience. If you have conscience, then only can you discriminate. It is from the results of conscience that we get discrimination. In most cases, disciples receive spiritual names from their masters. But in Vivekananda's case, it was just the opposite. He received his name from the disciples and he surrendered to them. Just before he was due to leave for America, Vivekananda decided that he would cross the seas only after having some concrete indications from his master, Sri Ramakrishna. It had been seven years since Sri Ramakrishna had left the body. Vivekananda waited and waited for a sign from his master, but in vain. At last, he argued, that his spiritual mother and the master were one and the same, and so he decided to seek Sharada Devi's permission to go abroad. Accordingly, from Madras, he wrote a letter to Sharada Devi. By the time he received a reply from her, he had had a most significant dream in which he saw Sri Ramakrishna proceed to the west over the waves and waters. In the dream, Sri Ramakrishna was beckoning Vivekananda to follow him. This Vivekananda took for approval of his plan. Presently, he received wholehearted permission and blessings from his spiritual mother. Now all Vivekananda's doubts vanished. With redoubled faith, he was able to undertake his historic voyage. People came to the original parliament of religions from various religions and various cultures. In most cases, they came to preach or speak about their respective religious beliefs. But Vivekananda came as a lover of humanity to sing the song of a oneness world home. He did not come here to propagate the views of his Hindu religion. He came to propagate the one religion that is known as man. He spoke of the individual man who is evolving into the universal man and consciously accepting the world as his own very own. Vivekananda was at once an ancient silence heart and a modern dynamism life. When Vivekananda came to Chicago, his dynamic vital embraced the whole world. In his very first speech he began, Sisters and Brothers of America. After those words, he was unable to continue for two full minutes because of the enthusiastic cheering and clapping of the audience. Immediately, Vivekananda had spread the feeling that we are all sisters and brothers. He showed the seekers of the West that he came to embrace them, not to conquer them. And as a result, he conquered their hearts because the words came from the very depths of his soul. True, we use the term sister and brother at every moment, 
but do we have the same genuine feeling as Vivekananda? In comparison to him, we are all frauds. We do not have the same genuine feeling as Vivekananda had when we use those terms. For us, it is like saying ladies and gentlemen. It is simply a form of address. When Vivekananda said, sisters and brothers of America, it was based on his dynamic, all-embracing vital. Girish Ghosh said something most significant about Swami Vivekananda and Nag Mahashoy. He said that on the strength of humility, one person can become smaller than the smallest. Again, another person, on the strength of his oneness with the highest, can become larger than the largest. In the case of Nag Mahashoy, Girish Ghosh said that he made his ego small, smaller, smallest, so that there was no ego left. Then he was able to blend with everybody. In the case of Vivekananda, he opened his ego and made it large, larger, largest. He said, I am one with God the Absolute, with Lord Shiva. I am Brahman. If an ordinary person dares to make such a statement, people will throw bricks at him. But when someone of Vivekananda's spiritual height says it, it is absolutely true. Vivekananda's ego was so vast, he expanded his ego and then he went beyond it. That is why there was no ego there. Vivekananda sang the song of the beyond, and he himself went beyond and beyond and beyond. Nothing could bind him. Nag Mahashoy became so small, like a tiny molecule, and that is why nobody could bind him. Nobody can even see a molecule. And in Vivekananda's case, nobody could bind him because he was so vast. He broke the net of Maya, of illusion, and then he escaped. Nag Mahashai became so small that the net could no longer hold him. He was able to slip through the gaps between the knots of the net. Vivekananda was such a huge fish that he broke open the net and swam away. And Nag Mahashai was such a tiny fish that he was able to hide inside the net. Then, at any time, he could slip through the gaps and disappear. When he was inside the net, you could not trace him. You could not even see him. If you looked inside the big net, this tiny fish, Nag Mahashoy, was nowhere to be found. The huge fish, Swami Vivekananda, just smashed the net and then he too could not be found. So that is the difference between the ego of Swami Vivekananda and the ego of Nag Mahashoy. Mani Shankar Mukherjee is a very great Bengali writer. He has written a wonderful book about Swami Vivekananda. I have read about Vivekananda all my life, but in Shankar's book, I read many, many things for the first time. This is one incident that Shankar himself told me when he came to New York. After the Parliament of Religions in Chicago in 1893, Swami Vivekananda became world famous overnight. Here in America, a few religious fanatics stood dead against him. They were trying to destroy his reputation by defaming him everywhere. Once Vivekananda and six or seven of his admirers were invited to dinner by a very distinguished lady. During the meal, they were all talking and talking about cabbages and kings. It was nothing to do with spirituality. They were in the seventh heaven of worldly talk. The hostess came and asked everyone, Now, would you like to have a cup of coffee? Vivekananda used to drink tea sometimes 20 times a day. He also drank coffee a few times, Shankar told me and his friends and disciples also drank tea and coffee. On this day, they were served coffee. Everybody started drinking it. As soon as Vivekananda lifted the cup to his mouth, he vividly saw his master Sri Ramakrishna. Sri Ramakrishna said to him, Naran, stop, stop, there is poison inside your cup. The fanatics had bribed the cook to put poison inside Vivekananda's cup. Many others were drinking the coffee and nothing happened. But Vivekananda's coffee was examined and it was found to have poison inside. And where was Sri Ramakrishna at that time? In heaven. This was the master's love for his dearest disciple. Sri Ramakrishna stopped him immediately, otherwise he would have died. Those fanatics were so ruthless. A real genius is not bound by any convention. A genius is a genius. He has to go forward like an elephant without paying attention to the barking of the dogs. Swami Vivekananda used to say that when an elephant is on the way to the market to eat bananas, the dogs bark and bark. But the elephant does not pay any attention. He goes to the market and eats the bananas and then he comes back home. The dogs are unable to enjoy the bananas. 
No country is superior to others in all spheres of life. Vivekananda, with his deeply penetrating insight, says, As regards spirituality, the Americans are far inferior to us, but their society is far superior to ours. He showed how a happy and true union could be effected between the other world-loving Indians and the this world-loving Americans. We will teach them our spirituality and assimilate what is best in their society. Asia, Europe and America. Each continent has made a contribution of its own to the world at large. With the help of his spirit's vision, Vivekananda revealed this truth. Asia laid the germs of civilization. Europe developed man and America is developing woman and the masses. It is an established fact that the women in America are the most advanced in the world, especially in the cultivation of knowledge. Vivekananda made a surprising observation. The average American woman is far more cultivated than the average American man. He further added, the men slave all their life for money and the women snatch every opportunity to improve themselves. His highest compliment to women came when he said, I have seen thousands of women here whose hearts are as pure and as stainless as snow. And again, American women, a hundred lives would not be sufficient to pay my deep debt of gratitude to you. I have not words enough to express my gratitude to you. When Sri Ramakrishna examined the young Naran's palm, he said, Oh God, you are not going to live for a long time. You will not have a long life. Then, when Swami Vivekananda reached the age of 39, he said, I will not cross the barrier of 40. I do not want to live. My time has come. He kept his promise. He passed away at the age of 39 years and 5 months. He had worked extremely hard while he was on earth. He suffered a lot. So when his time came, he wanted to leave. His great destiny was to die before 40. Can you imagine? And we do not even start our life before 40. On the day Swami Vivekananda passed away, everyone was swimming in the sea of tears. His physical mother, Bhuvaneshwari Devi, cried a little. Then she said something truly immortal. I am ready to give birth again and again to a hero like my son. He came into the world to raise the consciousness of the world. He has died at such a tender age, but I do not mind, because my son has played his role. I know that he was not for me alone. He was for the whole world. He has helped the world so much.